morning and welcome to Troy First Baptist Church on the first Sunday of 2021. It is customary in many places to sing Old Lang Syne to ring in the new year. We're going to take that familiar melody and we're going to put new Christian words to it and join us as we sing All Glory Be to Christ. Baptist Church. Here are a few announcements to add to your calendar. Don't forget, our youth meet in the youth building at 5.30 each Sunday evening with small groups every other Sunday at 5. Our children's club service is on Facebook every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Parents! Christ-centered parenting is back for the new year. We will meet and discuss what parenting looks like when it's intentional and share what works best in our homes. Join us this month as we discuss how to share your story with your child. Make sure to be here next week and the following weeks after that to attend our youth's fundraiser, the Caswell Coffee Bar, at 9 a.m. If you're unable to make it to service in person, we will have a drive through available just for you. Just drive up next to the kitchen. The dates for the Caswell Coffee Bar are the 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st. Come and give to a great cause. Make sure to stay updated with everything we are doing here at Troy First Baptist Church and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, check out our website at TroyFirstBaptist.net. 
At Troy First Baptist, we take Gun Tree every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Honduras. The government faces an uphill battle in establishing true stability and order. A young nation, Honduras's colonial past and military rule for most of its independence mean the democratic structures and mentalities must be nurtured. Corruption within the government, preferential treatment of the rich minority, and prevalent poverty make the nation vulnerable to structures of sin. Pray for righteousness and for wise and resolute governance. We're going to take a moment and pray, but we have one more picture to show you, and we're going to celebrate this morning a little bit. Uh, congratulations to Joy and Luke. Let's give them a hand on their engagement. Super happy for you, too, and can't wait to see what God does with you and your union. Um, and we're going to also pray for Honduras, and we'll pray for the rest of our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We come before you, and we lift you up, um, your name above all other names, and uh, be with those in Honduras, be with our brothers and our sisters who are there fighting for you and, and sharing your name. Uh, God, be with those who are lost that need you in that country, and God, may our prayers be lifted up, and may we, even from here, from Troy, North Carolina, that our prayers would reach them all the way over there. God, we love you. Be with us the rest of this service. May we worship you in spirit and in truth and change our lives this morning to where when we walk out of these doors that we are different people for you and for your glory. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Our oldest member at First Baptist Church turned 100 this year, Evie Poole. But our oldest attending member is Ruby Forrest. And she's 93. And the oldest attending member, this is one of our most up-tempo numbers, her favorite, and we just wish she could be here this morning as we sing together, Open Up the Heavens. Would you stand again and we'll sing, Open Up the Heavens, and dedicate this to Miss Ruby.
be seated. A few weeks ago, last month, Cameron and Chelsea dedicated their firstborn Judah to the Lord and introduced to us this new song, The Blessing. This blessing was written last year during the difficult year of 2020, and it is God's blessing upon Israel. It is by application of his blessing upon us as a church and as a nation, and we want to sing the blessing together with you this Sunday, the first Sunday of 2021, from the words of scripture that Chelsea will read during the song, The Blessing. Number 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. we thank you for this morning, for this service, for this church. God, thank you for the opportunity to gather together, whether in person or online. God, we ask that your hands will just be over the service. May your words on, through scripture become alive like you say that they do. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Why am I here? Why did I come in here? You ever one of those occasions where you go into a room to get something or to do something, and once you get there, you've forgotten the purpose while you came into the room? I see a couple of heads nodding. That's happened to me more than once. Maybe it's worse if you go to the store and you forget why you went to the store. What if you take a job and you forget the reason you wanted that job, not just for a paycheck, and now years into the job, you wonder, why am I here? Or maybe it's a marriage. People forget the reason why they loved one another and wanted to spend eternity together, and all of a sudden they say, why am I here? It's pretty bad if soldiers are on the battlefront and they ask, why am I here? And they forget the reason, the purpose for them being there. That's exactly the problem the army of Israel had in 1 Samuel chapter 17. They are a standing army with swords and shields, and they're looking at them going, what are these for? They're there risking their lives, but they have forgotten why they had gathered, why they'd come to the battlefront. They'd gotten fuzzy on their purpose. 1 Samuel chapter 17, join me beginning in verse 1. This is a story that is familiar even to people that don't know the Bible at all. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. They knew why they'd come to battle. They were going to attack Israel. They were gathered together at Socha, which belongs to Judah. In verse 2, Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Israelites knew why they were there. Their neighbors, the Philistines, were attacking. And they were there to save their lives, their families, their children, their nation. They're gathered together in the valley of Elah, which explains the standoff. Elah is a broad valley. My wife and I have been there, and it's got mountains on either side, and there is a very wide gorge in the middle that separates them, a natural border, a deep ravine, and no army could go un down into the ravine without being easy prey for the other side. So the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, verse 3, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. So neither could attack without becoming vulnerable, and so they have what we call a standoff. So naturally, here's a solution, verse 4. A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines. The word champion is literally a middleman. And that's what God did in sending his champion, Jesus, our middleman. But this middleman is named Goliath. And we go, oh, that story. Yes, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, even if they don't know it's from the Bible. He's the famous giant. Notice he's from Gath, and his height was six cubits and a span. Now, if you hold your arm up, from the tip of your finger to your elbow is supposed to be a cubit. And if you spread your thumb and your pinky as far as you can, that's supposed to be a span. So if you have six cubits and a span, that's nine foot, nine inches tall. That's pretty tall. He would be the tallest guy not only in the church, he'd be the tallest guy in the world. But this is not some unbelievable Paul Bunyan legend, some 40 foot giant. Nine foot nine is pretty believable. We've got giants today who have problems with the pituitary gland who are nearly this tall. Archaeologists have discovered human remains that are this tall and taller. So here is a real giant, and in verse 5, even more imposing, he had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. He's kind of like a tank, a personal tank. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Sounds big, it was. That's over 200 pounds. Pretty imposing. And in verse 7, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. Just the head of the spear weighed 25 pounds. Talk about carrying a big stick. This is psychological warfare. And for the Israelites, this is more about fear. For the Philistines, Goliath is more about fear than he is fight. This is not really good mobile weaponry. Verse 8 Goliath stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Now he taunts them like a bully, but he asked them a good question. Why are you here? Possible they've forgotten? No, no. 
He says, Choose a man for yourselves, a champion. Let him come down to me, for he, if he's able to fight with me and kill me, yeah, sure, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, wink, wink, of course, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Here's the deal, solution. Not a lot of people die, just one person die for all the people, which is exactly what God did again in Jesus. Verse 10, Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. This is kind of like Biff saying to McFly, what are you, chicken? Come on. He defies them, which is the word literally scorn and insult you. Verse 11, the psychological warfare works. When Saul, the king, and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they weren't motivated and saying, charge. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. The psychological warfare works. There is silence. There is crickets. Sometimes the greatest giant is not outside us. Sometimes the greatest giant is fear inside of us. Verse 12, now David, oh yeah, here's the other character. Yeah, we know that story. A young teen at this point was the son of Jesse who had eight sons. The three oldest sons, his three oldest brothers, had gone out in the army to follow Saul to the battle. They got to fight. He had to stay home. The names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab the firstborn, Abinadab, and Shema. David was the youngest, the runt of the litter. But the three oldest followed Saul. He had to stay home while the big brothers got to go out to war. But verse 15, David occasionally fed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. This is to tell us why David is not out there, because in chapter 16, David had been chosen as Saul's armor bearer and his musician, kind of his therapist. When Saul would get depressed, David would play guitar for him and cheer him up. But he's home right now because he would have to be a shepherd, kind of like Jesus is our shepherd. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days Morning and evening, he came 40 days. That's a long time. My wife was recently gone for 40 days with her mom up in Pennsylvania. I have never been in 38 years away from her as many as 40 days. And those 40 days were long. But here's a whole army away from their families, away from their homes, sleeping out under the stars for 40 days. And it seems like forever. And maybe they've forgotten why they're there. Verse 17, Then, 40 days, Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves. Take them some sandwiches. And to run to your brothers at the camp. Take a care package. If you've ever been at college, at camp, or at boot camp, you know care packages from home are a gift from heaven. Take them some food. And also he wants them to get some news. Verse 18, carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousand. See how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Support the front lines, which is kind of what we do with our missionaries. We send them gifts to encourage them and to keep them on the battlefront. But verse 19, now Saul and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, 41 days later, fighting, wink, wink, with the Philistines. Oh yeah, they were fighting with the Philistines, right? How many bullets had been fired? Zero. They are cowering. They're sitting there and the bully's coming out every day, twice a day, challenging them. And they're on the other side of the valley playing cards or looking at their cell phones or something. But they have forgotten why they're there. They are not fighting with the Philistines. If they were, they wouldn't have forgotten their purpose. Verse 20, so David did what his dad said. He rose early in the morning. He couldn't wait to go. And he left the sheep with a keeper. He didn't leave the sheep, as Jesus would never leave us. And took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight, yeah, and shouting for the battle. Now the question is, shouting for the battle, is that the soldiers for Israel, or is that David? Is shouting for the battle go with, he came to the camp, shouting for the battle, or were the soldiers going out and shouting for the battle? I just can't picture these Israelites shouting for the battle, because they're not battling. They're, they're fearing. Their knees are knocking. I think David is the one shouting for the battle. He's the new guy. He can't wait to see. He's running and he can't wait to see the battle. He runs shouting for joy. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army, 
but no one's doing anything. So maybe they're just, every time a television reporter comes along, they all pretend to be fighting. Quick, here's a photo op. Oh, here comes David. Let's pretend to be fighting. So verse 22, David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, so eager, and he came and he greeted his brothers. Hey, guys, how is it? And they're going, oh, it's terrible. You know, we're, it's not going very well. He's excited. And they're depressed. Then as he talked with them, coincidentally, just that moment, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath, coming up from the armies of Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. Now, they've heard him for 40 days, fee fi fo fum but they've heard it for 40 days. For them, it's ho-hum. But this is the first time, notice, David heard them. The other guys have kind of heard it so many times they don't hear it anymore. But for David, this is fingernails on a chalkboard. He's not defying us. He's defying our God. Verse 24, all the men of Israel fled from him. 41 days later, they're still running. They were dreadfully afraid. They said to David, have you seen this man who has come up? Get a load of this guy. Wow. And David's thinking, you call this fighting? They say, surely he has come up to defy Israel. They have forgotten about why they're there. Have you seen this guy? He's amazing. Have you heard about the reward? It shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give him exemption from taxes. Wow. He's promising to put $600 in your bank account. Sound familiar? He's promising to give you his daughter. Maybe she wasn't that good looking and that's why she wasn't married already. Wait a minute. Did we come out here for a paycheck? Are we risking our lives for one of us to get a bride? What is this? Exemption from taxes? Yeah, that sounds good. How long is that going to last? Verse 26, David says, never mind that. Look at this classic reply. David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Never mind that junk. Who needs $600? Who needs an ugly wife? Reward? Really? He's got to bribe you to do what you came out here to do? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Do I need to remind you? What is your purpose? He's got a fresh perspective. And sometimes newcomers do. We get used to the mess. We get used to a pile of clothes in the corner in our house or in our church. But when a visitor comes, they notice. They say, well, David is a visitor. And he notices, are you guys forgetting? Our living God is bigger than any nine foot nine giant. His courage and his outrage, his anger embarrasses his big brother. So Eliab in verse 28, his oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. You're embarrassing me. Come on, shh. Why did you come down here? Here's the question again. Why are you here? Why did you come down here? Good question. Maybe if he asked himself, you came down here to battle and you haven't done anything in 41 days. And then maybe not to David so much as to his brothers. He says, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's talking about the family fortune, and he's belittling it because he wants to make little of his little brother and his little job. We're here doing mighty battle, and you're back home taking care of the sheep. You've left the sheep. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. He doesn't know squat. I know the insolence of your heart. You've come down to see the battle. You've left them. No, he doesn't leave them. He presumes on his little brother. He doesn't know anything. And leave it to a big brother to pick on the little brother when the little brother's right and the big brother's wrong. One of the easiest things to find on God's green earth is someone to tell you all the things you can't do. And usually in your family is easiest. So here is the text for this morning's message. Verse 29. David said, what have I done now? What's your problem? Here it is. Is there not a cause? Repeat that with me. Is there not a a cause. Have you forgotten why you're here? I know why you're here. You don't. Have you forgotten why you've come down to the battlefront? Is there not a reason for being here? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. Is there not a cause? And these people answered him as the first ones did. This is a great question. To these soldiers, he says, have you forgotten why you've come? Today is the first Sunday of 2021. 
And God wants to ask us, Troy First Baptist Church, the same question. What is your purpose? Why are you here? Is it possible that we, like them, have forgotten the purpose of the church? Is there not a cause? We want to ask it again, especially for 2021. If we know why we are here, if you know why you came into the room, you can do what you came into the room for in the first place. If you know why you took that job, you won't be bored. You won't want to get out because you're just working for a paycheck. If you remember why you got married, the marriage will be filled with joy. If you remember why you're at war, not just a paycheck, you'll be motivated. If we remember why we're a church, we'll not only know why we're there, a reason, but it will also made, motivate us and build morale in us. You remember when they first got to the battlefront, they were motivated. Why'd they come? They knew why they came. Because the Philistines want to kill us. And if we don't defend ourselves, we're going to die. Our wives and children will be taken. Our nation will be overthrown. They knew their cause. They had motivation. They had morale. But after 40 days of inactivity in verse 11, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Not because of the giant. Because they had forgotten their why. They had forgotten their cause. And so they were dismayed and greatly afraid. That sounds like us in 2020 and now 2021, doesn't it? Verse 24, all the men of Israel fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. These guys were afraid of their own shadow. It wasn't the giant, it was their purposelessness that caused them to be afraid. It looks like they needed some motivation and morale, so that's why King Samuel gave them the artificial, alternate, additional morale in verse 25. Here's their motivation. I'll give you great riches. Okay, I'll make a $2,000 in your bank account. I'll give you my other daughter, the good-looking one. I'll give you exemption from taxes. Is that why they're there for a paycheck for a wife? Is that why you're at your job? If you're there just for a paycheck, maybe you need to look for another job. Is that why we're here at church? We may need to be bribed, but when we lose our purpose, we lose morale. Everybody knows what they do. Here's a little chart that kind of tells us about the human population. What is the big circle? Everyone knows what they do. Ask a person two things when you meet them. What's your name? They know that. What do you do? And whatever it is, I'm retired, I'm a housewife, I'm an engineer, I'm a janitor. Everybody knows what it's the first thing that we identify ourselves as. This is what I do. This is what I am. Some people know how they do it. The ones who know how they do it are experts. They become teachers. They tell other people how to do what they do. But very few people are in that inner circle of those who know why. And the ones who know why are the ones who have not only morale, but motivation. They're the ones who know why they do what they do. They have the secret. Ask someone who is a janitor what they do, and if they tell you, I mop floors, they know what they do, but they've forgotten why they do it. Maybe they mop floors in an elementary school, and I help prepare children for the future. Maybe a daycare worker who says, I change diapers and watch kids, has forgotten why they're there. If they know why they're there, they're saying, we are building the future. I am helping grow responsible citizens. Let's take someone who works in a shoe factory. What do you do? Well, I staple leather together and I make shoes. No, that's not what you do. If you know why you're there, you help people get where they're going. That motivates you. If you're there to make sales, to make more money than anyone else, you've forgotten why you're there. If you're only motivated by money, then you're like these soldiers who will only go risk their life or you know, you've got to raise it from $2,000. Maybe someone is a bricklayer. And if you ask them what they do and they say, I lay brick, they're probably not too excited about their job. But if they say, I build homes for families, or I build great cathedrals, they haven't forgotten why they're there. Some people call me preacher, but that's not what I do. I do that one hour a week. But I like being called pastor because that's why I do what I preach and I, and I visit and, and I pray and I do what I do because... I make a difference in people's lives, and even more than that, in people's eternities. And when I forget that, 
The paycheck is never enough to motivate you and build morale. So are you doing what you are doing for a paycheck or a purpose? Move from being in the big what crowd, past the how crowd, to the why, it's not a crowd, and you will be motivated and have morale. The wise man says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. If you don't see the big picture, if you forget your purpose, if you have lost your cause, your why, you die a little bit inside. And friends, when the church forgets why she is here, then the heart is gone. We are not here to keep the lights on. We are not here to meet the budget. We are not here to keep the programs from the past running. We are not here to put butts in the seat and bucks in the plate. We are here to build the kingdom of God. And when we forget that, we lose morale. Why did I come in here today? Well, I got a job to do. Why did you come in here today? It's because you feel guilty if you don't. You come in to get a blessing. Why are we here? You see, David was an inspired man after God's own heart because he never forgot his purpose. The one who asked, is there not a cause, knew his cause. So my question is, do we? If we know our why, we will find a way to do what we need to do. We'll know what we need to do, and we'll know how to do it if we remember our why. Carol was a young wife in my very first church in New Jersey. And Carol, if anybody knew her, knew one thing about her. She had never flown, and she never would because she was deathly afraid of flying. She didn't like heights, but she didn't like planes even more. Until one day, at 35, she found a why. She and her husband, Mike, decided they were going to adopt a little girl, a daughter, from Russia. And they had to go get her. And she overcame her fear of flying. And she would go for that cause. If there is a cause, you will find a way to do it. Others may say it's impossible. To you, you can't do it. But you can do it if you have a why. A football team will find a way if there is a why. What is the, what is the reason? What do you do? Why do you do it? What about the military? The military needs to have a why in order to keep on doing what they know they need to do. And for the church, we must never forget, it's not about buildings or budgets. It's about eternal souls for whom Christ died. When we lose that, we lose the essence of who and what we are. When we have a why, we know why we came into the room, we can do what we need to do. When we get in that room, when we know the why of our job, we know why we got married, why we went to war, it not only gives us a reason for being there and motivation and morale, it also gives us, secondly, unity, and it reduces friction. A cause unifies us and reduces friction. In verse 19, they were all together as one, and remember they were, quote, unquote, fighting the Philistines. That's why they were there, not to fight each other, but to fight the enemy. When they first got out there, they were a team with unity, and they were all rallied about one cause, a common enemy. But after they were out there 41 days and they hadn't fired one bullet, they were fighting not the enemy, but who? Each other. Hey, you cheated on that hand. Oh, David, you embarrassed me. And so Eliab is not attacking Goliath. He's attacking his brother David. They're fighting each other, and isn't that the way we are in the church? When we forget that the enemy is out there, not in here. And the enemy is not our neighbors. The enemy is Satan. They are not the enemy. They're the mission field. When we feud with each other in here, what do we feud over? We don't feud over the why. We feud over the what. My what is more important than you do. I teach Sunday schools. Well, I do this. And when we fight over the what's, we realize we have forgotten the why that we all share in common. The Apostle Paul pleads with a very divided church in Corinth. When in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, There are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Why? Because they forgot their purpose. One says, I am of Paul. And another, I'm of Apollos. They forgot their purpose. No, they're of Christ. He who plants and he who waters, that's Paul and Apollos, are one. We all have one purpose, one cause, one why. For we are God's fellow workers. On a football team... There are different players with different positions and different what's. One player blocks. One player 
passes, one player catches, one player runs, one player plays defense, one player kicks field goals. If they forget the why, maybe they're there to win the game. Hopefully they're not there for a paycheck, especially if they're in college. If they're there to win the Super Bowl, then they can be unified. But if they start saying, my job is more important than yours, I deserve more money than you do, they become divided and there is friction. We all have different what's, we all have different jobs, that's okay. But we better have the same why or we're not one body, we're not fellow workers. Let's change the analogy from football to basketball. In basketball, it happens in every game. Two players with the same uniform go up for the same rebound. And what does everybody yell? Same team. Every time I see two church members feuding with each other, I want to yell, hey, same team. You may have different numbers on your uniform, different names on the back, but the name on the front and the color and the uniform is the same. We all play for Christ. So let's quit feuding with each other. Remember the why, why we are here. We're not here to make money. We are not here for any number of reasons. Whatever your how is, whatever your what is, we are here for one single why. And when the church forgets that, hey, look, nobody's paying us. No one's paying you to come to church. As a matter of fact, most of us are paying to come to church. So what's going to keep us united? We can have endless pep rallies and tell people, okay, do it and, and you'll feel better and we'll build morale and unity. But when we forget the cause of the why, people are going to be divided. You know, David was an inspiring, innovative leader because he never forgot his cause. He was a great leader, unlike King Saul, because he was innovative. We'll look at that next week as we look at the end of this chapter. But he was an inspiring leader because he knew why. Do we? I pray that your pastor, your staff, your deacons know why we're here. We're working together on our why. But leadership comes from knowing why. Whether you liked him or not, Steve Jobs was a very successful businessman and he was a man with a cause. You may have heard of his company, the largest company in the world right now till Amazon laps him, Apple. He didn't want to build a computer in order to become rich or famous. He wanted to change the world. And when he reached the limits of his capacities, he realized that he wasn't a great businessman. So he looked for a CEO for Apple in the early years and he looked big. So he called the president of Pepsi John Scully. He said, John, I'm going to give you an opportunity to change the world. Come on over to Apple and we'll put a computer on every desk and we'll change the way. We'll, we'll bring the whole world together. And John Scully kind of laughed and said, I don't want to, I don't know anything about computers. I don't want to come there. And Steve Jobs said something profound that has haunted me since I read it years ago. He said, John, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water? Or do you want to come to Apple and make a difference and change the world? Now, you have to admit, Apple has changed the world a lot more than Pepsi has. But Steve Jobs had a vision that was too small. Apple doesn't change the world. Jesus does. But he was on to something. Do you want to spend the rest of your life doing little things? Do you want to do it for a paycheck? Do you want to do it for a trophy? No army will ever lay down their life for a little cause like money. They have to believe in the why. Have we forgotten our why? When we know our why, we know why we've come into that room. We know what to do. We have morale. We have unity. When we are remembering why we have the job or married, we have a reason. We have motivation and morale, but we also have a third thing. We have focus, and it allows us to evaluate our success or our failure. When we remember our why, we know if we win or we lose. How do we know what to do, what, if we don't know the why? How do we know when we win or lose if we don't know the why? Remember in verse 26, David had the why. He knew the reason why they needed to defeat the Philistines was not to save their own necks, but to take away the reproach from Israel, and more than that, to take away the reproach from the living God. Guys, you've forgotten what it's all about. You think we're just out here to play a game. We're going to keep score and then we're all going to celebrate at the end of the day. No, 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 no. He focused on the why so he knew what was at stake. So here's the question. If we know the why, if we really know why we're here, we can really evaluate if we're winning or if we're losing. And friends, 
Sometimes we can delude ourselves into thinking that we are holding our own. We can look at the numbers last year and praise the Lord in an unprecedented year in our church history when our churches were empty for one quarter of the year, 13 weeks, and cut in half for the rest of the year, we made budget. Praise the Lord. That is amazing. And we can think, wow, that, that's great. And we baptized one person. Praise the Lord. But friends, when we realize it's not putting butts in the seat and bucks in the plate, but it is bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, then we realize we're not winning. We're not even tied or catching up. We're losing. Our purpose is found in the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Ask yourself this question. Is God's will being done in the world right now in January 2021? No. Is it being done in the United States of America? No. Is it being done in Montgomery County? No. How about in First Baptist Church of Troy? God earnestly desires that not one perish, but we are surrounded by people who don't know Jesus. And friends, we are losing. And the only way we can know that is by reminding ourselves of what our purpose is. The Apostle Paul, again, a man driven by his cause, was incredibly focused. He's the one who said in Philippians chapter 3, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me, my purpose. Brethren, one thing I do. He's laser focused because he knows the one thing that God built him to do. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So ask yourself this question. How did Paul not lose his morale when he was arrested for preaching the gospel and thrown in prison? How did he keep from picking on other Christians and feuding with people on this side? How did he not lose his focus? He kept his eyes on the prize. Now, I can't say that phrase without referring to a modern preacher, a Baptist preacher, Martin Luther King Jr. Whatever you might think of him morally or politically, he was an inspiring, an incredibly inspiring leader. And I'll tell you one of the main reasons why. Because he wasn't about a what, he was about a why. His most famous speech, he did not say, I have a plan. If he had a plan, everyone would have walked away. No, he said, I have a, a dream, a why. And it, in many ways, has changed society. That dream gave morale and unity and focus to a movement, to millions. You know, I think his dream was too small. I think the church's problem is that we dream too small. As a matter of fact, I think we don't ask too much. I think the church asks too little. We're afraid of the big ask. We don't want to ask people for things. In my first church in Georgia, they had this little saying. I don't know if you ever heard it around here in North Carolina. They said, yeah, we have preacherettes who preach sermonettes to Christianettes who smoke cigarettes. And I thought, wow, that's pretty brutally honest. Little Christians hearing little sermons, asking little tasks. And if you think about it, what do we ask of people? Come on, give us a try. You know, sit for an hour, sit quietly for an hour. And maybe if you feel like it, you could put a little bit of money in the plate, tip God. And, and we, don't, we don't want you to overturn your life. You don't have to turn away from your sin. You don't have to do anything big. Very little we want to ask. Now ask yourself, what did Jesus ask? Jesus didn't say, give me a try. He didn't say, give me an hour a week. He said, take up your cross. Deny yourself. Doesn't sound like a prosperity preacher, does he? Follow me. He told that man, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Jesus didn't ask a little. He asked a lot. And the people followed him in droves. Why? Because he asked for something that challenged people. He wasn't building a club. He was building a cause. 
Part of our problem reaching younger generations like millennials and Gen Xers and Gen Yers and Gen Zers is they don't want a duty, a what, a how. They want a cause. They want a why. And the church has become so insipid that young people say, why bother? We don't want to do anything half-hearted like that. They're not looking for a position. They're not looking to relieve their guilt or to look good. They don't want to play church. And unfortunately, that's what they think we are doing. Maybe we just ask too little. You see, David was a courageous giant killer because he never forgot his cause. Goliath wasn't too big for him to hit. Goliath was too big for him to miss. Have we forgotten our cause? Maybe our cause is too little. If it's anything less than God's cause for us, then it is too little. Another figure from history you've never heard of, Samuel Pierpont Langley. Samuel Pierpont Langley, about 120 years ago, was determined to be the first man to build a flying machine. Not a lighter than air, but an airplane. Samuel Pierpont Langley had everything going for him. He had unlimited resources. You see, the government gave him a $50,000 grant to fund his project. Now, I know $50,000 is nothing to you. You got that in your sock drawer. But in those days, that was a fortune. He had unlimited resources. He had unlimited help because, you see, he was on the staff at the Smithsonian Institute, and he was teaching at Harvard. And so he had all of his friends helping him build this airplane. He also had all the notoriety because the New York Times was following him everywhere he went. He had everything you needed, endless resources, endless help, endless publicity. Meanwhile, there was a couple of brothers, maybe you've heard of them, Orville and Wilbur, whose father, the preacher, Reverend Wright, said man was not meant to fly. If God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. They wanted to prove their dad wrong, and they wanted not what Samuel Pierpoint Langley wanted. He wanted fame and money. He wanted to be the first. Orville and Wilbur wanted to fly. They didn't care about money. They didn't have any money. They took the proceeds from their little bike shop to support their little project. And every single day down here at the North Carolina beach, they took five sets of parts because they would crash five times a day and they would save up till they could go back out again with five sets of parts and try again. They didn't have any money, didn't have any help, didn't have any education. They didn't have a college degree. They didn't have any notoriety. Nobody was there to take a picture the day they succeeded. But you know what? They did succeed. Why? Because they had a why. And here's how I know that Samuel Pierpoint Langley didn't have that why. The very minute they got off the ground, Samuel Pierpoint Langley threw in the towel and said, that's it. If I can't be first, I don't want to play. He didn't try to improve the airplane. He just looked for something else that he could be the first at so he could be rich and famous. Wilbur and Orville got what he wished for because they had a why. And here's what makes us different. Not what we do. There's hundreds of churches who do what we do. How we do it. What makes us different is why we do it. What makes us a church and not a club is why we do what we do. So why do we do what we do? You know, Jesus never forgot his cause. When nobody believed him, including his brothers, when the leaders of his nation, his own nation, falsely accused him, lied about him, tried him, and had him executed, Jesus never lost morale, never lost focus, because he knew his purpose. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come. Why did I come? Oh yeah, that's right, to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't lose morale. He didn't lose focus. He remembered why he was there. So the $60 million question is, what is our cause? Is there not a cause for Troy First Baptist Church? Why are we here? Okay, so you came into the church building this morning. Why are you here? To hear a sermon? To get blessed? To be a blessing? Why are you here? So you don't feel guilty? Don't want to miss? Jesus tells us, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. We don't have to build his church. Jesus is building it. We just have to get out of his way 
So what do we have to do to fulfill his why? We're here to build his church. But that's pretty vague. Building his church, we could say, well, we're here to build his church. Okay, how are we going to focus on that? How are we going to know when we are winning? That's too generic. Notice one thing in this verse that we often forget. The church and the gates of hell, we get mixed up. It's not the gates of the church, like we are hiding behind the gates, fighting a defensive battle. Notice it is the church that is attacking hell. It's the church on the offensive. Uh, we have trouble getting outside of these walls and attacking our own city, let alone attacking the gates of hell. But we're supposed to be on the offensive, accomplishing God's what? Because we are trying to accomplish God's why? So what is it? It's not specific enough to say to build his church. That's not going to motivate us, give us morale, reduce friction. It's not going to focus us. Okay, so here is the answer. Last week, Cameron let you in on a little secret. Our church's purpose is cleverly hidden each week on the front of your bulletin. Pull it out. Your bulletin every week has our purpose broken down into three simple statements, eight words. Knowing God, changing lives, connecting with each other. Say that with me. Knowing God, changing lives, connecting with each other. Why are we here? Why are we who we are? God made us to know Him. And so it's all about becoming more like God, for us to know Him. And so we come to know him better when we are in a group. But we are to change lives. And that is twofold, because that's discipleship, us, our lives changing, and evangelism. Here's the Great Commission in two words, changing lives. Evangelism is seeing other lives change. It's not enough for our lives to be changed. Oh, we're all happy, kumbaya. What about those people out there who don't know Jesus? We are here to change lives. We'll be able to know God in heaven. The one thing we won't be able to do in heaven is see lives changed. And then, the reason we're here is connecting with each other. We can't do this alone. And so it's about fellowship. It's discipleship, evangelism, it's worship, and it is connection. It is getting to know one another and connecting with each other. That's not only what we do, but why we do it. We want to know God because we were built to know God. We want to have our lives change and see other lives change because that's what God hardwired us for. We want to connect with each other because made in the image of God, as Pastor Cameron talked about last week, we are intimately social. God is a community of a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit. We need each other. We are not complete alone. And that's why it is so important that we meet together. Hebrews tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And during this virus, there are some people who have to stay home and choose to stay home. But as soon as you can... As soon as it's safe to do so, if you're safe going to Walmart, you can be safe coming here. Much safer. This ought to be the first place you come back to, not the last place. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things will be added to you. It is about knowing God, changing lives, and connecting with each other. Have we forgotten why we are here? I was sitting on an airplane, and I asked myself the question, Why am I here? I had been on an evangelistic team going to 300 churches in 300 days all around the country, and we were seeing great results, people being saved almost every night. But then I got sick, bumped my head, and as a result of that, had dizziness and spit up blood and thought I had some kind of concussion. And so they put me on a plane from San Bernardino to St. Louis to Philadelphia to go home and get an MRI. Sitting there on the plane, I was discouraged. I, I could be with everybody else doing that meeting tonight and seeing somebody saved, seeing changed lives. Why am I here on this plane? As the plane took off, I opened up my Bible. I was reading the Bible when the woman beside me said, Oh, what are you reading? Well, there's an open door. I mean, I'm not a guy who's going to start preaching at everybody on the plane, but I want an opportunity to talk to a captive audience. And so she saw me reading the Bible and said, I'm reading the Bible. Have you ever read it? Pretty easy. She goes, yeah, I have. Do you, do you know the Lord is your Savior? She didn't. And I began to tell her about what the Bible was all about, who Jesus was. And before we landed in St. Louis, she bowed her head, 80 years old, bowed her head and accepted Jesus as her Savior. 
I didn't have time to think about it because it was time to unpack and get into the airport and try and find my other plane. I went into where you go at the airport. I went to the men's room and I was washing my hands at the sink when a man came to the sink next to me, looked at me in the mirror and said, did she do it? I said, did who do what? He said, did she pray to receive Jesus? I said, whoa, how do you know? He goes, I was sitting right behind you and I heard you talking to her about Jesus and I prayed the whole way. And he reminded me why I was in that plane. Did God put me in that plane to tell her about Jesus? I don't know. But my purpose on that plane was the same that it had been in the church if I would have been in the church in San Bernardino, was to see lives changed. Never forget your purpose. Wherever you are, if you are sidelined, if you are homebound, there is still a way to see lives changed. Your purpose, whether you are here or whether you are watching remotely, is the same. Knowing God, changing lives, connecting with each other. We're going to connect today at the Lord's table. Jesus didn't want us to forget what it's all about, so he wants us to focus on his death and his resurrection. If you're at home, you need to find a way to connect with others, maybe around your table today. Invite someone who is not positive, someone who's tested negative. Reach out and connect with somebody today. But today, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table and remember why we're here. In 2021, let's have 2020 vision about why we're here as a church. Knowing God, changing lives, connecting with each other. We're going to say that every Sunday, all of January. Let's pray. God, help us to remember why we're here. Oh, God, help us to remember that army on a hillside that forgot their purpose, lost their focus, lost their unity, lost their morale. Lord, that's a pretty accurate picture of your church today. Lord, 2020 was hard. But Lord, we all face giants every day. Help us as your church this year to remember why we're here so we're unified on the why and the how and the what. Lord, as we come to your table, Lord, would you remind us of our purpose, of your purpose for us. For in Christ's precious name we pray, amen. Hi, this is Pastor Jeff. If you are a regular attender at Troy First Baptist Church and our home because of the virus, Thank you for tuning in. If you are around the world, someone who's been watching from afar, we want to thank you for joining us each week. We've been very encouraged by the number of views and by the great feedback we've gotten. We're glad that you join us online. Of course, we look forward to the time when we can all be together in person. It is something that the Bible requires us to assemble together. We certainly understand those who can't because you're around the world or those who at home choose to stay home for your health's sake. But today, as we enjoy together here at Troy First Baptist Church Communion, I want to give you something that Jesus said to his disciples right before he had the, the Lord's table with them. It was a Passover meal. In Luke chapter 22, he said, I have long desired to have this meal with you. We long to have communion all together. Communion means together. We've celebrated it together here. And we encourage you, if you would like, to have communion elements at home. But remember, you can remember Christ all the time, and if you are having communion alone, it's not really communion. Maybe you can find someone else to commune with and remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can take some crackers, you can take some bread and some grape juice, and you can remember the Lord's death till he comes. But we look forward to the time that you can join us and we can have communion together. We have communion once a quarter, the first Sunday of each quarter, and so we hope in three months you'll be able to join us. We hope that when you start getting out of the house and going around, that the church is not the last place you come, but it's the first place you come. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so when you come out of your hole and when you are able to get up and get around, we hope that we can see you back here at Troy First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us each week, and we hope that you do remember his death till he comes.